name is Sophie Spiegel, class of 2013, and I would like to welcome all of you, students, your families, alumni, and friends, to the Pembroke Center's Family Weekend Program, an alternative to nature v. nurture, biology in a social world. The Pembroke Center is home to Brown's Gender and Sexuality Studies concentration, and I am a leader of our department undergraduate group. Today's program is sponsored by the Pembroke Center Associates, a group of alumni and friends who support Brown's Pembroke Center for teaching and research on women. The Pembroke Center plays a unique role at Brown University. Founded in 1981, the center was named in honor of Pembroke College in Brown University and the women of Pembroke and its predecessor, the Women's College. The Pembroke Center offers a rich array of interdisciplinary research programs and courses that bring together faculty from the humanities, social sciences, public health, and creative arts to examine the benefits and risks that arise from social change. Our scholars examine social critique and intersecting issues of difference, such as gender, race, class, sexuality, citizenship, language, and inequality. The center also supports the Christine Dunlap Farnham archives and the feminist theory archives that preserve the history of Brown and Rhode Island women and the intellectual history of feminist scholars. We also offer grants for Brown students doing innovative research in a wide range of disciplines. I hope you've picked up a Pembroke Center brochure and newsletter, and I encourage you to visit our website for more information about our programs, activities, and research. Before we get started with our program, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. <coughs> Anne Fausto Sterling is the Nancy Duke Lewis Professor of Biology and Gender Studies at Brown University. She has served on the Brown faculty for more than 40 years and has been a visiting professor at institutions in the US and abroad in departments of biology, medical science, gender studies, and science studies. She is a fellow of the American Soci Association for the Advancement of Science and has received grants and fellowships in both the sciences and the humanities. Dr. Fausto Sterling is the author of two pioneering works on gender and sexuality, Myths of Gender, Biological Theories About Women and Men, and Sexing the Body, Gender Politics and the Construction of Sexuality. Her most recent book, published this year by Routledge, is Sex Slash Gender, Biology in a Social World. Dr. Fausto Sterling is a frequent commentator in some of the world's leading media outlets, such as the New York Times, PBS, Psychology Today, and HuffPost Science. Debbie Weinstein is the director of the Gender and Sexuality Studies concentration at Brown, where she also serves as the assistant director for the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. She's a Brown alumna, class of 1993, and was a postdoctoral fellow here at the Pembroke Center in 2002 and 2003. She received her PhD in the history of science at Harvard, and her work focuses on gender, sexuality, and race in the history of medicine and the human sciences in modern America. She teaches courses on the body, science, medicine, and queer and feminist theory. Her book, The Pathological Family, Cold War America and the Rise of Family Therapy, is forthcoming from Cornell University Press in 2013. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope that you enjoyed the discussion. We invite you to stay for a few minutes after the program to enjoy some cider or a glass of wine with us. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Well, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Debbie Weinstein, and I also want to um, second the thanks to the Pembroke Associates for hosting this event. I also want to say how personally honored I am to be conducting this conversation with uh, Ann Foster Sterling, who's been a mentor of mine since I was an undergraduate uh, here at Brown. And I do want to just begin on a personal note. I entered Brown planning to concentrate either in English or in environmental studies. And then in the spring of my first year, wandered into a class on women and minorities in the sciences, taught by Anne, and um, that literally changed my life. Um, she became my concentration advisor for an independent concentration that followed the pattern of what is now the science and society concentration. She was my honors thesis advisor. She got in my path to graduate school in the history of science at Harvard and mentored me upon my return to Brown. And I mention this here on Parents Weekend 
both to thank Anne for having been such a wonderful mentor, but also to encourage all of the parents here uh, to support their children, the students who are here, as they explore new fields of study and take academic risks. Um, it's one of the beauties of Brown that there are courses like this to help you take those kinds of risks and explore fields that you might not have expected to explore. Um, and it can open up all kinds of opportunities for them. So um, I encourage you to support your students in that way. So, but today we're here to talk about an alternative to nature v. nurture, biology in a social world. And I want to begin um, by asking Anne Foster Sterling to talk about the title for this event. Um, so, nature v. nurture, what do you um, see as the contours of this debate these days? And how and why does your work provide an alternative um, to more standard framings of that opposition? Um, thanks, Debbie. And I just want to say on my part, what a pleasure it is to be able to travel with someone from their freshman year to the point where they are a colleague on equal footing and, um, and where I have as much to gain from interacting with them as vice versa. So it's really, it's, it's really a great deal of fun when that happens. Um, so nature v. nurture. First, I, I want to say that I think that these days, the nature-nurture debate is a fallback for a lot of people because it's how people know how to think. But actually, uh, the whole contour of that so-called debate is really changing. And it's changing, um, it's changing across the board uh, because people are becoming much more aware of the ways in which uh, nature and nurture are, are integrated Phenomena, and I'll give you an example in in a second. Uh, but I think that one of the things I've been trying to do for some time, and I have to say, with huge support over a number of years from the Pembroke Center, uh, without which I couldn't have come as far as I have, has been um, to provide a new vocabulary for people to use. I, th I think that one of the reasons people fall back on thinking about nature and nurture in terms of an opposition instead of a, um, a, uh, a cooperation uh, is that they don't have good language to think about things otherwise. And so your old language becomes your fallback position if you don't develop a new vocabulary with which to think about the world. So how are nature and nurture um, not easily separable for one another. I was just rereading this morning, partly in, in preparation for this conversation today, a study that was published at the end of last year on London taxi drivers. Uh, and London taxi drivers go through a huge training process uh, in which they have to memorize all of the streets of London their relationships to one another, whether they're one way or not. And then the major landmarks that are on those streets. I, I saw a little video uh, this morning of, um, uh, of one of these training sessions in which the trainer shouts out the name of a street. And he says, what's a, what's a good restaurant on that street? And they have to know the names of the basic restaurants, the, obviously the landmarks of, uh, of other sorts. Uh, so researchers studied the brains, and particularly a part of the brain, of taxi drivers uh, before their training, during their training, and as they became um, active cab drivers. And then also, it's a long-term study. They're studying what's happening to their brains after they stop driving. And it turns out that all of this training literally causes a particular region of the brain, a particular part of the brain um, called the hippocampus, to grow. It literally, so it adds on new synapses. It doesn't add in, it may add in new neurons as well, but a whole part of the brain literally gets bigger compared to people who don't study to learn to be a taxi driver. Um, so, and then if you follow them, it stays bigger and it continues to accumulate size. Uh, at, it's at a slow rate uh, because our, our nerve cells grow and stabilize pretty slowly, uh, but, if they've also begun to study retired cab drivers. And what they find is that that same area begins to um, get smaller again. So it's, it grows to a certain size. It's maintained through use. And it begins to lose its size again through disuse. So literally, 
their training to do a very to fill a very particular cultural niche in London in 2011, which is to drive cars around the streets, um, results in their physical biology changing, in their brains changing. Um, and that's an example in which you can't say nature or nurture are separate things, because they're not. Um, the one um, the one alters the other in, um, in directions that are, are surprising. And because this is a longitudinal study, these researchers could show it wasn't that people who were born with a larger hippocampus became cat taxi drivers, which would be the idea if you said, oh, it's nature, and then you know, that enables them to do this cultural task. It's the actual cultural task itself that, um, that caused a change in their biology. So that, and, and I would argue that as we develop and become who we are, that those kinds of events are writ large within our body, um, and that there isn't, it, and there isn't a way to think about the biology separate from the experiential input. Um, so. so then to push this a little further, it occurs to me as you're talking that nature then codes for a few things. Nature sometimes stands in for something that was innate that you were born with that's biological in some way. That might mean, oh, we can visualize it in the brain or it's genetic. Or Biological could mean a whole host of things, but that also might mean it's unchanging. And then, nature, and then nurture stands in for a whole other set of things. And part of what you're arguing about is both is against the distinctness of nature and nurture, but also potentially against some of those associations that come with those words. Yeah, that's a great point, Debbie. Um, the, there, are, there are two things about the old nature-nurture debate. One is that, as you said, when people say something is na it, it, it's, it comes from nature or it's in the genes, they often think that the implication of that is that it's permanent, unchangeable, and fixed in some way, and also inevitable. Um, whereas when they say, oh, it's, it's nurture, they think of that often that comes with the baggage of being almost inf infinitely pliable. Um, and neither of those things is true. That is, we all know that there are cultural phenomena that are extremely difficult to change. And we only need to look at something such as unequal pay for equal work. Um, to know that that's very hard to change. I mean, you, you pass a law, it changes some, you have education, it changes a little, you make that gap go down 5%, and yet it's still stuck there. Um, it's still stuck at an unacceptably high place. That's, it's a cultural phenomenon, it's extremely difficult to change. Uh, and on the other hand, um, there are natural phenomena with, which change with experience with the environment. So. Um, so, so as a stand-in for things that are either fixed or changeable, uh, neither nature nor nurture work as a good stand-in. And instead, as always, we need to understand how the two things work together and how they work together at many different levels of organization, from um, from the genetic up through to the to social structures and how businesses are run. So the subtitle for today's event, and also for your new book, is Biology in a Social World. So what, what does that phrase evoke for you, and how, does it, um, how do you write about it in your own work? Well, it's, a, it's always hard to find a way to, to get people to think about biology differently. Um, but I think the main, the main thing for me is to try to get people to be thinking about biology, and particularly the body, as always having an existence within a social framework. So we, don't, we are social animals. We don't exist outside of a social framework. Um, we literally cannot survive alone. Um, you know, an, an, an infant born without social input dies. Uh, so um, it, we are social from the, very, um, from the very beginning, from before birth, really. But uh, so for me, the idea is to begin to understand how our biological, uh, our physiology, our genes, um, our anatomy, how all of these things work, how they develop within a social context, how the particular social contexts affect how our physical and physiological selves develop. Um, for me, uh, a critical point 
is, I mean, I was trained originally as a developmental biologist or a developmental geneticist, um, which in the, in, the, in the old world, that would have been called an embryologist, but by the time I was being trained, that, that notion of embryology had proceeded to a notion of development. Um, but the notion of development has changed through time. Um, and so for me, I can't begin to understand or to even think about humans without thinking about their development. So anytime someone presents me with a snapshot in time, I, I, I think of it as a cross section. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a time series, it's not a what happened from time one to time two to time three to time four. They're just saying, well, here's how it is at time four. And so for me, I want to know how it, got to, how it got from time zero to time four. And it could be some claim about sex differences, for example. Um, I don't know. Uh, what's one people say? I don't know. Women notice detail and men notice the big picture. I mean, the, these are kind of crappy little claims anyway. But, uh, but people do studies on adults and can find a study that shows something like that. And, uh, and in the old days, I used to only try to take apart the study on its own terms. And usually, you can do that. Um, but now, what I, what I try to do in order to think about that is to say, all right, let's grant the study for a minute. Let's say, OK, suppose that study was well done and it found this particular difference. Then I want to say, how did that difference c come into being? Where did it come from? How did it develop? Um, because there's almost no difference um, in behavior or capability that I know of that is present from birth on. Um, so you always move back to a point in time when there was no difference. And this is both what dynamic systems people do and also um, science studies people like, um, like Bruno Latour, whose, whose work fits in with this very well. Uh, from my point of view, is they say, to study a phenomenon, you need to go back to a time before it existed and watch it come into being. Um, and you can do that developmentally if you're studying psychology. You can do it through history if you're studying the development of a scientific phenomenon. Um, but there's always a time when a thing that you're talking about didn't exist, and then it does exist. And the question is not necessarily just that it now exists, but where did it come from? How did it get to that point? So one of the ways that you phrased this question in um, one of your Psychology Today blogs was, uh, if we do not pop out of the womb with pre-made traits, then what are the processes through which traits, preferences, and feelings develop? And I'm curious, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you are exploring that question in your own research today. OK. Um, first, first, I want to say that um, give, give an answer to that a little more generally. Absolutely. Which is uh, the processes by which, when, when an infant is born, that infant is essentially flooded with experience. And it's almost, it's almost all sensory experience. So from, and actually from be, before birth, because an infant starts hearing sound and um, having light and movement input uh, before birth. Um, and uh, so, so when an infant is born, they are flooded with visual input, with tactile input, with smells, with sound. Um, so they have sensory experience, which is, um, which is and, and they have a, a, a still undeveloped nervous system. So the sensory input from the start is beginning to shape the development of their nervous system. And so that's a general background thing to, to think about, which is, and so when you say experience, it's not, or when I say experience, I don't necessarily mean, oh, the mother yelled at the baby once when it reached for a football. What I mean is that there's a daily experience that starts from the moment of birth on of touching, of listening, of seeing, of smelling, um, that, and the infant's job is to integrate all of that into some kind of meaning. This is all, and, and uh, the baby is hearing speech, but is not emitting speech for quite some time. So the baby's job is really integrating all of that experiential input. 
Um, and it's at that level that I think a child learns about the world, learns about what structures the world, learns about gender um, as one of the structures in the world, not the only one, but one that's pretty salient, pretty early in development. Um, and so I think that, uh, that that's the important place to be looking. In the early days of feminist psychology, there was a lot of focus on something called socialization. Usually looked at in older kids, and usually it was much more in the category of um, sort of studying what are the rewards and punishments of, uh, that, and, that children receive for certain kinds of behaviors. Um, do they receive, does a girl receive criticism for being interested in footballs? Does a boy get teased for liking dolls? Um, it's that, that's, a very, that's a very high, and I think a very late level of input for understanding the emergence of gender. So what I started doing a number of years ago, and again, I will emphasize, with the support of the Pembroke Center, and not just the moral support, but actual money, um, uh, which was essential, because to do anything out of the ordinary in psychology is, for, with funding is, is virtually impossible. Psychology is a very closed down field. Um, it doesn't want new ideas. Uh, it has its methods. You can't try anything new. Um, and you can't even, I still can't even get my work published in psychology journals. So, I mean, it doesn't want to hear it. So, uh, so without the Pembroke Center, I could never have done these explorations. And I'm still in the process of, of working out the data from the study that the center enabled me to do. Um, and, but what we did was use a database that we received, that we were sh shared with us by a psycho psychologist who also was on the faculty at Brown. Um, and he had done a study quite a number of years ago on, um, on temperament in child development, and he'd made videotapes weekly in the home of mothers interacting with their infants. Um, and so what he did was share the videotapes with us. So we had weekly videotapes from age three months to, eight, to age 13 months. So we had this huge, rich developmental data set. And um, I teamed up with a colleague in psychology, Cynthia Garcia Call, uh, and we hired dozens of, gra of undergrads over the, over the course of several years. And uh, we began to do what the psychologists call code the videotapes. That is, we began to observe uh, the interactions of mothers and their infants. Uh, and we didn't, I only had a big general hypothesis, which was that it is the daily mundane inputs and interactions which are important in shaping, um, in shaping the emergence of gender. And so I wanted to see whether there were different inputs and interactions from mothers of boys and mothers of girls. And so we looked, and so we guessed, you know, we, we coded all sorts of things, uh, 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 both infant behaviors and maternal behaviors. We coded um, things like uh, gross motor training, assistance with movement, um, affectionate touch, uh, speaking, um, vocalization of various sorts, a whole series, uh, probably over 300 codes by the time we were done, uh, b by the time we did big codes and subcodes. And now I'm in the process of sorting through the data, but I can tell you that there are definitely some differences in behaviors between mothers of boys and mothers of girls uh, with regard to vocalization, for example. Mothers speak more to girls than they do to boys. Um, and they vocalize more to girls than they do to boys. Over a and, and boys and girls start out vocalizing at the same amount. Um, at three months, they're both making lots of vocalizations. And boys kind of decrease relative to girls. And girls, girls have a little bit of a dip, and then they go scooting up. Um, and at the same time, the maternal, res the maternal speech and maternal vocalization completely parallels. So. Um, there's differences, which I'm still working through, but there are very different patterns in, um, in affectionate touch. Uh, and there are very different patterns in assisting locomotion, uh, where mothers move boys around a lot more. They, uh, they assist them in walking and crawling a lot more. And the boys also start crawling, uh, actually crawl more. Hmm. So um, 
So there's a whole lot of things like that that we're just beginning to dig out. Um, but they aren't the sort of things that you'd notice on any one observation. They're small, subtle, daily kinds of, of differences. So as you're talking, I have a couple of different questions about that. Um, one, maybe you can tell us a little something about um, the characteristics of your sample study of the mothers, the population that is included in the video set that uh -huh. you're looking at. Um, and then a separate question that relates more to your own theoretical work, which is um, you, in an earlier answer, mentioned dynamic systems theory. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what dynamic systems theory is and how that's helping you in frame your study. OK. Uh, well, the sample, si the sample, first of all, is a small sample size. This is very labor intensive work, huge data sets. Um, and, uh, and also limited by the fact that we didn't design the experiment. We took what we got. So it is not a sample to be generalized to the world because it is middle class, first time mothers from Rhode Island, white. <laughs> so it's a, it is not, you know, but I, but I think, I mean, my hope with, with this is to, is to demonstrate that this approach could be of you, could be interesting so that people could plan longitudinal studies um, in a better, more comparative fashion. And you, to do that, you would have to like choose one little piece of it. You couldn't study the breadth of things we're studying with because just the time constraints are way too, too big. Um, but you could then increase your, um, the diversity of your sample size in, in some way. Uh, so, so it's only a pilot study and it can only, it can only be that. But hopefully it would stimulate people to to address this question of, of diversity, because I think um, I'm sure that whatever we find will differ in diff culturally different populations. Uh, we already know that in terms of things like how different populations train infants in motor skills. I mean, a child that's strapped to a mother's back most of its first year of its life has a very different pattern of motor learning and walking to start with than someone who's you know, left out on the floor to crawl around, so. Well, in a way, that uh, then segues nicely then into my second question about dynamic systems theory, and, and part of that is to ask, how does dynamic systems theory um, frame how cultural experience turns into bodily difference? Okay, so dynamic systems is, uh, is an approach to um, studying organismal development that has several different layers to it. Uh, first, it's developmental, and, and that's in itself is one of the things that attracted me to it. Second is it's multi-level, so it it argues that um, that you need to understand not only muscle development and brain development in order to understand where walking comes from, but you need to understand um, cultural context and physical context. Uh, so uh, the old idea about how an infant learns to walk by developmentalists who were pioneering this in the 40s was that they learned to walk and then they learned to crawl and then, uh, I'm sorry, they learned to crawl and then they learned to walk. Um, and well, first they stood up, then they learned to walk. And this was because they, um, the motor development, I'm sorry, the, the neural development in their, in their motor cortex of their brain matured and as it matured it supported more complex movements. Um, now, the, the person whose work um, inspired me in this area, Esther Thalen, uh, really began to look critically at that theory and to look critically at, um, at whether or not infants uh, could control movements more than was thought at, at a time that was younger than supposedly the motor cortex was developed enough to do. And she did a series of really ingenious experiments. Um, she, for example, and, and she argued that, that a lot of like self-random movement was part of an infant's body learning how to control its own movements. Um, and that a lot of it was muscle control and not just higher brain region control. So she did some experiments well before infants could begin to crawl in which she lay them on their back and she put a mobile over their head and she tethered one of their feet to the mobile and um, this is a big reward for the infant. It kicks its foot and the mobile moves and it thinks it's great. Um, and, but at first, I mean, if you've seen a little tiny infant, at first it's kicking its feet. It's just flailing around at random. Um, but these infants learned very quickly with the reward to control their, their flailing. So they got feedback 
that enabled them to learn to, to give, get a motor control that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, they, uh, there are other studies. For example, I think many of you are aware that there's been a movement in um, Western countries to have infants sleep on their back to uh, lessen the frequency of sudden infant death syndrome. And one of the consequences for that apparently has been, um, and there's still follow-up studies on this being done, but it has been that, some, that infants don't always learn to crawl. Um, and if you think about when they're sleeping on their stomach, they're pushing up with their arms, they're, they're developing um, neuromuscular, they're, they're stimulating neuromuscular development of the sort that facilitates crawling. But um, a certain number of kids that are only, have only slept in the supine position um, go straight from, uh, from sitting to walking. Hmm. Um, and they skip that so-called obligatory crawling stage. So, uh, so the physical context of how the child has been raised makes a difference in their neuromuscular development. Uh, so dynamic systems theory then talks about um, these different levels of development, the, 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 the motor cortex of the brain, the muscles themselves, the weight of the baby, um, the uh, physical surroundings of the baby. These are each things that are happening at different levels of organization, but they feed back on one another um, in a dynamic way. And no one of them controls the other. Um, but that at certain points they reach states that are fairly stable. So, uh, so you will have you will have a, if you if you watch a child just learning to walk, uh, you know it's not a very stable state. I mean they're kind of toddling around and they fall over and they pick themselves up and they. But as their as their neuromuscular um, development continues. And, and they'll revert to crawling. They'll crawl instead of walk because it's, it's the more stable state for them. Um, but at some point, walking becomes the more stable state and they won't crawl anymore. So walking then becomes what the, what the um, dynamic systems people would call an attractor state. It's the more stable physiological state for the infant to be in. And it's more stable for a whole variety of reasons, not just, um, not just because their motor cortex is as a certain point. Um, it's more stable, also it depends on things like um, what, what's underneath their feet. Uh, and we all know that too. I mean, we're more stable walking on a firm ground than we are on, a, on sand, for example. Um, so there's always the notion that you're looking at a, at a system that includes biology, it includes um, context that's generated by a social system, uh, it includes uh, you know, that could be every, everything from shoes to what's underground to, um, to whether we live in tree houses. I, I mean, but, uh, and, that, and that it assumes a certain physiological stability. We also know that our own physiological states aren't necessarily stable. Uh, so we have an accident, we have a spinal injury, um, we have a muscular injury, we um, become unable to walk again. We may learn to walk again, but um, so we can reachieve walking, uh, but it won't be the same walking we did before. It'll be a different set of, of systems that we've recruited in order to again achieve walking. So dynamic systems theorists use the idea of stable states which are supported by multiple subsystems. And one or more subsystems runs into trouble and the whole stable state falls apart. Um, and there's a, you know, they argue there's a, a period then where the whole system becomes very chaotic or the phenomenon is very chaotic and then you can restabilize. It'll be a different stability. It'll again be supported by, um, by, uh, by a set of subsystems, but they may be different ones. So I'm curious, maybe you can spell out um, a little more explicitly how you applied developmental systems theory, which wasn't explicitly developed to deal with things like gender, identity, and sexuality, to some of your own research and maybe what some of the challenges have been in that process. Um, so I, I will say I wouldn't put that in the past tense because okay. I'm, I'm really still working this out. And um, first, my first stage of working it out is rather crude in general. And as I move through it, it becomes, as I think more about it and I read more and I look more at my own data, um, 
I begin to sort of revisit things and make them more specific. Uh, so if we think about, one of the things I've written about recently with regard to gender and sexuality is the phenomenon, it's been in the news a lot, of um, children who have uh, very early um, gender identity issues, I guess would be the way I'd call it. So a three-year-old biological boy who says, who insists that he's a girl. Um, and because the phenomenon can show up in children so young, um, the question is raised as, is that quote innate or inborn? Did something mess up with the kid's brain um, in, in utero that then makes inevitably him believe he's a girl instead of a boy? Um, and again, uh, what I, I'm asking instead, what are the things that go on developmentally? And I don't have an answer to this, but what, what is pretty clear is that, um, is that no one's been looking at infancy in this regard. Hmm. And no one's been looking at uh, what infant psychologists call pre-symbolic formations. So infants take in a huge amount of information, again, back to the experience they have, they have, um, they have sensory experience going on nonstop. They're organizing it in various ways. They're getting information from, um, from adults of various, of various sorts through their sensory systems. And at the same time, in this same first year, they're also um, learning about gender. So uh, gender, and they acquire knowledge about gender um, in slowly. Uh, they can begin it by six months. They can tell the difference between a male and a female voice. They can tell the difference between a male and a female face. By nine months, they can link them. So they can, they can, they can know that a male face belongs with a male voice um, and or a female face with a female voice. They can't do that at six months. They can at nine months. Um, they, uh, they still have no preferences of their own, nor do they have any ability to identify themselves as male or female. Um, they, so these skills continue to develop from a period which is in which they're, uh, all of their memory systems are, are embodied in their nervous system, but are not uh, what psychologists would call symbolic. Um, they begin to develop in their second year the ability to, um, to get to both label other people and label themselves a little bit at first and then more later. And they use, interestingly, they use, um, they use external cultural um, cultural insights to label themselves. So at first, if you show, um, if you show um, an 18-month-old, well, first they begin to be able, before I get to that, they, they begin, by 18 months, they begin, they can recognize gender stereotypes. So if you show, and this is even before language, if you show an 18-month-old um, pictures of a woman with a hammer or a man putting on lips, lipstick, they indicate that that's an unusual, that that startles them. And so, I mean, the, the way you do these experiments, I could go into later, but, um, but the fact is that they recognize that that's um, a break out of the norm. Um, so they, ha they, uh, they already can see and register cultural gender-related stereotypes by the time they're a year and a half old. They can't speak yet, they can't identify themselves yet as boy or girl. Um, but, they, but by about two years, they can. So, so the, the main point here is that they've learned a lot about a system of gender before they start to place themselves in that system. And so they begin to place themselves in that system um, they start probably start to by about year one and by about year two, they place themselves in that system. Um, they place themselves in that system based on external characteristics. So if you show um, a child a picture of a naked boy and a naked girl and say which one is like you, they can't do it. They don't know. But if you show them a picture of a child dressed as a boy, or a child dressed as a girl, or the same child with a long wig on or a short wig on, they will identify according to the, to the cultural stereotype. So they will identify a child with long hair as a girl um, at age two. Uh, 
So, um, so they've learned these external characteristics. They don't really get that genitalia are related to it until they're surprisingly old, anywhere from three to five years of age. Uh, so, uh, and someone once asked me, and it's a great question, um, what would that be the same in a culture where kids didn't wear clothes? Um, and my guess is probably not, but it, that, is, that is, I think kids use what they can see. Uh, but, um, but the point is that they are acquiring their own identity at the same time as in, and somewhat a little bit later out of sync with their acquisition of a huge amount of knowledge about gender. Um, and a second point is that at that time between two and three years, as they're acquiring language, they are also acquiring the ability um, to think with symbols. So um, pink then can come to symbolize something feminine. Um, whereas kids, infants, uh, neither boy nor girl infants are really very interested in the color pink. They mostly like blue and red. They like good strong colors. Um, but they can begin, so they're learning symbolism, language, self-identity, and Cult, the cult and, and gender norms slightly precede all of that. So for me, the answer to how does a three-year-old end up with a gender identity that's at odds with his or her genitalia has to lie in that, compl that developmental complex and those developmental sequences. And I can't be more specific than that at this point, but it seems to me that's where one wants to look rather than just saying, oh, they had the wrong hormone in utero. They might have had some different hormones in utero, but that isn't enough to tell you how they ended up where they are at age three. And what does developmental systems theory do then in terms of integrating biology and culture specifically around these kinds of issues? Because some of the things that you've mentioned were potentially not hormones, but looked more like what might get categorized, categorized as nurture, potentially. Well, um, one of the things about identity um, is that it's something very strongly held and felt. Uh, you don't get rid of it easily. I am willing to believe it is part of a neurological structure, although when you push people who write about gender identity to t tell you what they think it is neurologically, they can't even understand the question, um, which is interesting to me. But I've, I've pushed college, colleagues in sexology to say, all right, you think it's inborn. What is it? Where is it? It's, you think it's in the body. What, where? And they're like, what? They, they don't, it's not a comprehensible question to them. So I think this is an area that requires exploration, but it's something that's so, for some children, I need to say, by the way, that longitudinal studies of children with so-called gender identity disorder, as it gets characterized by, in, in psychology as a disorder, and there's a debate about whether it is or is not, um, which is, I don't, I don't want to get into, um, but, one of the things that happens is if you follow these kids through into teenage, their teenage years, a certain number of them um, persist and become transgendered adults, about half of them, but the other half don't. The other half sort of, um, at some point, change over to their biological identity. Uh, their, to their bio, birth, wrong words, change over to their, to their birth anatomy, that is, their, they have their identity match their birth anatomy. Um, so the question for me is, why, what is it that's so strong about identity or gender identity in these kids, and also for kids who, whose identity and anatomy match? I mean, we also, just, just as strongly, um, these, uh, a child who is born a boy and by age three knows he's a boy and by age six knows he's a boy, um, that's a very strongly held identity. W what is it that makes it so strongly held? It has, I'm thinking it has to be something that has a neurological component to it and f that the answer has to lie somewhere in our understanding better the relationship between mind and body. Um, which I do think is from my, you know, I'm, I am trained as a, as a biologist, I think there has to be some kind of neural embodiment of identity, um, which makes it very, a very fixed trait, but not a necessarily a permanently fixed trait, because 
I mean, if you, if you study the literature on transgender individuals, you can read biographies of people who, who, who switched identities in, um, in a very profound way in their 60s. Uh, so it's, things happened in their lives to, that caused them to change, uh, is my guess. Um, so, in, and in a dynamic system sense, I would say whatever the systems were that were maintaining their identity, say, as a male, got disrupted enough that when, it re when their identity, their sense of identity restabilized, it restabilized as a female. Um, so, so it's, it's really the dynamic systems for me offers that general framework to both understand the extremely stable nature of the pheno of phenomena like identity and like um, and and gendered behaviors of various sorts, but also to understand that they are not infinitely stable. They are not necessarily permanent or fixed, but that they have the capacity to destabilize and restabilize in new form. So, what do you see as the stakes of this work? You know, what does this tell us? Uh, how does it help us look at human problems or policy issues in a new way? Well. The stakes, I think, there are many different, there are several different stakes. Um, one is socially how we deal with, with these phenomena. Um, a common way to deal with something like transgender is to treat it medically. To say the stake is that if someone can prove that they are legitimately transgender, that they have been born as a female in a male body, that the answer to their distress then at being in the wrong body is to, um, is to change the body. And that's a, a medically complex and dangerous set of procedures that involve hormones and surgery um, and a whole set of things like that, and has in fact generated a whole industry around it, a whole medical industry around it. Around it. Um, the, uh, so that would be one way if you, if you argued that, uh, that, um, that it was just that way and you should just fix it by fixing the body. Um, other stakes might be, other approaches might be to focus more socially on a world that maybe could, um, could accept people in, in, um, Discontinue, I'm not quite even sure what the right word is, but who have discon, discontinuities between their identity and their physical bodies. If there are ways for them to live in the world, um, and I think you know, Judith Butler has written very eloquently about, about that and there being no place in the world for people to live who, um, who are discontinuous in that way. Um, maybe the medical approach wouldn't be the only one available. Uh, in other areas of identity, for, for example, um, sexuality identity as being gay or straight, uh, the stakes have been very big in terms of um, social legislation with where uh, the gay movement itself has very um, strongly used the idea that we're in our genes that it's an inchangeable phenomenon because it's genetic, um, that that's the argument, that's the basis on which an argument for equal rights and equality has to be made. Uh, so um, whereas the religious right has often said it's used that word choice um, and because they associate homosexuality with sinful activities, then the idea that you could choose not to sin is one that would argue against offering civil rights to people who, who have made this negative choice. Um, so there are huge political stakes, especially with regard to, um, to uh, homosexuality. So I'm going to ask one final question, and then we'll open it up, which is, um, as you're talking, you know, at the beginning mentioned, oh, my first book, I took one approach, challenging studies. Now I'm taking a different approach. And I'm wondering, you know, as, as our conversation wraps up. Maybe if you could just reflect on the trajectory of your own work and how it's changed over time. Well, you kind of just said it. I mean, I, <laughs> but you have anything to add? Yeah. Well, I, I can add some detail. Uh, I am. Um, I mean, when I did my first book, 
I was coming at it very much from the point of view I was an, an active research scientist who worked on fruit flies. Um, and I uh, was also uh, an activist in the feminist movement. And at that time, which was light years ago, uh, many of the arguments against feminism were based on biology. So um, you had, you ha and you had prominent people saying, well, women can't be world leaders because they, um, either because they menstruate or more likely because they would be going through menopause and they would act irrationally, um, unlike some of the male leaders. But um, <laughs> uh, the fear of irrational action from women leaders has always been kind of fascinating to me. But, um, or women don't get to the top in business because um, they don't have testosterone, and we all know that testosterone makes you aggressive, and that's why you get to the top. Um, or testosterone makes men great athletes and women don't have testosterone so they can't be great athletes. Remember, this was before Title IX was passed. I'm old. Um, so, so, I mean, many of you in the room have grown up in an era which always had Title IX. Um, in, so, uh, and, uh, so, for me, uh, as a scientist, a young scientist challenge, and also a young feminist uh, challenge with those arguments. Uh, and people would stand up and challenge me with them all the time and also challenge other people. I was like, well, I wonder if they're true or not. So that's what got me into it. I just went and read the literature and came back at the literature from the point of view of a scientist saying, here's the studies that show this or that. And I, categorized them and I cataloged them and I showed what their weaknesses were and, um, and that was what Myths of Gender was. Uh, at the same time, doing Myths of Gender moved me out of my comfortable seat as a scientist and pushed me to think more first about history because I saw some patterns, some historical patterns that I couldn't, um, I couldn't shake. Uh, the, I mean, uh, an important historical pattern was that, uh, was that these questions sort of reappear generation after generation. Um, and uh, and it, the, the scientists, and I, I, I still have colleagues today who would, I think, say this to me, was I did a great job at debunking bad science, but if only the good scientists had done this work, we wouldn't have had this problem, and I'm like, well, wasn't Charles Darwin a pretty good scientist? And, uh, but if you read his Descent of Man and his theories of women, they're so evidently Victorian theories. Um, and uh, so I was like, I, it, it can't be. And, and the people in my own day, they're the people who get elected to the National Academy of Science. They're the people who get, um, who get uh, huge publicity, they get their promotions, they're full professors at Harvard. You know, they, the, they aren't, bad scientists by the conventions of science. So how do they get to do the work they're doing? How does it get counted as good science? Um, and why does it keep happening generation after generation? Well, that forced me to start thinking about how science itself works, which is what pushed me into science and technology studies, which is a field that tries to look at how scientific knowledge is made within a cultural context. Um, and to understand the question as I phrased it to myself, which is how does culture become a part of scientific knowledge without on the whole ruining scientific knowledge because most scientific knowledge is good enough for us to use it in our day-to-day -day activities and to rely on it. Um, and I'd rather rely on an empirical study that was well done than on you know, the phases of the moon for making my decisions about life. I really would. Um, and so how can those two things be happening at the same time? That led me into years of thinking about what is objectivity, how, you know, how is science work in its, in its cultural way, how does, how does gender become part of it, all of these different things. And so that all came out, my thought about, thoughts about that came out in, um, in the second book. Uh, and then, but as the second book, started forcing me to think more about, well, if I don't like this oppositional language, nature and nurture, um, culture science, uh, male, female, if I don't like this oppositional language, what else is there? And that's when I first began to read about dynamic systems theory, 
Um, and the minute I read Esther Thalen's work, even though she doesn't write about gender, I knew that was what was needed. Um, and maybe it's not the only way to, to think differently about it, but for me it's been enormously helpful. And so that's what pushed me um, actually to apply to do a seminar on embodiment through the Pembroke Seminar, again going back to the Pembroke Center as being a place that enabled me to do um, interdisciplinary thinking and work that where no other place, where there was no other home for that to happen. Um, and that enabled me to be, to move into this current phase that I'm in. I think that's a great opportunity to take some questions from anyone in the audience. Yeah? Um, you mentioned previously that they did studies on 18-month-old babies um, being able to identify <clears throat> the gender roles. But if the babies couldn't speak yet, how did they know that these roles were conflicting? Um, Okay, there are other ways to communicate besides speech. Uh, the question is, if babies couldn't speak, how, how could we know what they were thinking? Um, well, of course, we can't at some level know what they're thinking, but the way you do studies on, on pre-linguistic kids, one way, is you do what's called an habituation study. You, can, you set them up in a dark room and we're in their mother's lap, some, or depending on what age they are, um, and you show them a series of pictures. So you might show them, and, and you measure how long their eyes stay open. Um, and, so you, and so you habituate them to a series of pictures. So you might show them a man hammering and a woman washing dishes. And you might show them a dozen pictures that are gender role conventional. And then you slip one in of a man putting on lipstick. And you see what happens to their, to their eyes and how long their eyes stay open. And they go, huh? I mean, they don't, they don't make the noise, but their eyes um, respond that they're seeing something out of the ordinary to them. So that's how you do it. The, the, in, in back, yes, you. Yeah, the, the question is what about the prenatal experience? Um, I think that the prenatal experience is, uh, is pretty important and there's pretty interesting studies. For example, neonates, that is the day they're born, already um, respond differentially to their mother's native language. So they will respond to the rhythms of French if their mother is a French speaker. They will respond more than they will to the rhythms of English. Um, they have body movements that are already more in sync to spoken Japanese if they are born from a Japanese mother. Um, so they're clearly picking up sound and movement prenatally. Um, and there are enough of these studies now that, that it's, it's quite clear that that's true. So, um, so maybe we should all be playing the violin to our, to our um, enlarged pregnant bellies. I don't know. But, um, but there is certainly external information, sound and light at least, and probably movement, that, um, that the fetus is hearing and responding to um, before it's even out in the open. So, so definitely it doesn't begin at birth. Um, and then there are all of the other uh, physiological things, I mean, that, that as you say, we know about. I mean, there's, there's diet, stress, all of these things are affecting the neurophysiological um, axes, developmental axes of the infant. Um, it's also, there are also beginning to be some really interesting studies on um, how things like uh, for instance, there's a, there's a team in Israel that's very interested in how touch affects cognitive development in, um, in premature infants. So, so they do, it's a, called a, they use what they call a kangaroo pouch, and they had studies of premature infants who are held close to the skin, skin to skin touch in a little pouch for certain amounts of time. And then they measure later cognitive milestones at, a year or so, and it's quite clear that the actual physical touch um, positively affects later cognitive development milestones. It also affects, um, affects the infant's ability to self-regulate things like, um, like heartbeat rate and sleep cycles. Uh, so it's pretty clear that, that there are things that are going on prenatally um, that even, even, or an infant that's, that's stressed by having been born too soon, 
um, that that stress can be mitigated by postnatal physiological um, sensory input of various sorts. I think our notions of, of how are still pretty primitive. But clearly, again, there's this dynamic interaction um, that may be a, pretty important for, uh, for our understanding um, these moments of, in early development. Yeah. The question about where does the persistence of, when you said my thoughts, where does it come from, the persistence of bias in a field, or is it? I mean, just anywhere you want to take that. OK. So why does bias against women persist in fields, especially in the sciences? Um, and I think there are a variety of reasons why it persists. Uh, I think science, maybe more than other fields, is um, has a harder time fixing itself because of its own self-beliefs about being objective. Um, so objectivity is something that's, it's a virtue that's highly prized in science, and for good reason, because it's how you do good science. It's not a, it's not a bad thing, objectivity. Um, but because it's, it's such a highly prized virtue, scientists have a much, uh, much and uh, successful scientists believe that one of the reasons they're successful is that they're especially good at being objective, which means it's especially hard for them to believe, think of themselves as not being objective. Um, and a, a, a general um, indication of this is that I, I review peer-reviewed articles for a wide variety of fields, from the social sciences to the sciences. And almost all the social sciences now use um, a double blind, which is to say, when I receive a paper to review from a women's studies journal or a psychology journal or a sociology journal, I do not know who the authors are. I do not know what university that it was written from. That cover page is gone. I'm just reading the material. And occasionally, I've, I'm sure I know who it is, and I'm almost always wrong. Um, sometimes I can figure it out. But um, whereas the sciences refuse to do blinded peer review. So it's only single blind. The, you don't know who the reviewer is, but the reviewer knows who the research team is and what university they come from. And whenever I've raised this with my colleagues, they say, well, you can't do it double blind. Of course you're going to know who it is. Um, and how would you do it? And then and you'll lose valuable information. Um, that information being that you think you know what the capabilities of a particular research team are. So, um, so Getting the sciences as a field to believe that they c might end up not being as objective as they think they are, at least in the social realm, turns out to be pretty hard. And I think one of the reasons is that it's so, um, that it is so, objectivity is such a deeply ingrained virtue that no one in sciences wants to think of themselves as not being objective. I think, I think they get very upset at the idea, very offended. Um, so, uh, I mean, I know they do. I've, I've seen the offense rise to um, unbelievable levels from my point of view. Uh, so I, that's, that's one response. There are other responses, but yes. Um, so we're in an interesting era with regard to scientific authority. Um, I think scientific authority is being challenged 
from a place that surprised me when the challenge first happened, which is from the right wing. Um, so at least in the United States right now, we're in this era where scientific authority is being challenged, scientific objectivity is being challenged around things that I believe are true, like climate change. Um, and uh, my response, I, I'm kind of baffled by what the best response is to it, because on the one hand, I want to, um, I want to support the idea that good scientists are basing their points of view on data that they have thought seriously about and that they've gathered in a responsible way. Um, on the other hand, there is, there is all of the science of race and the science of, of, um, of gender, which I think requires a much more critical point of view. So it's actually, I think right at this moment in time, it's a very tricky question to answer. I don't, I don't have a clean answer for you. Um, but what I, I, I do think that the field which is most likely to help us think about how to answer it is the field of science and technology studies, um, which is, which is um, where people often who've had a great deal of scientific training are poised to look at this intersection between, um, between policy and science. How, you know, what's the difference between data and how data gets turned into policy, for example. Um, with regard to young scientists themselves, uh, I, I think that, you know, long term, the, there has to be a better way to train scientists to think in more social contexts. So, uh, right now, graduate education is still very focused on narrow disciplinary training. I would love to see an element of interdisciplinarity come into to training at the graduate level. Um, we have this a little bit, at least in theory, we're supposed to now be training our scientists at least how to do research in an ethically responsible way. Some um, science departments take that task seriously and really they give a whole t course on research ethics, but it's a pretty narrow course. It's about how do you handle co-authorship and how do you, um, uh, how do you uh, deal with scientific fraud if you encounter it, what's, you know, what are the limits about how much you can doctor a photo before you're cheating, um, and, you know, the, the, and those are important questions. I don't mean to, to denigrate them, but they don't get at what you're asking, I don't think. Um, so I would love to see um, additional aspects of training at the graduate level that bring in this question of how do we deal with and understand our research in a broader social context. Um, so what do we do when a science reporter comes to us and says, well, doesn't this mean that you've just proven that homosexuality should be banned or whatever, you know, um, and this wasn't, this was the furthest thing from your mind as a young scientist, you, you know, all you were doing was studying some interesting gene. Um, so I think we need a place where we teach our, where we train our young scientists or young professionals how to work in a social world because I think science is no less and less something that exists outside of this bigger, highly politicized world. And, um, and I think that's the place at which it has to happen. There has to be a different kind of graduate training that enables that to happen. Why don't we take one last question and then I'll invite everyone to stay for reception and continue the conversation casually. Yes. Um, this may be a Like, like what? Like, for a fragment, might be a very adaptive survival figure. I'm sorry, I still didn't get the word. Flight. Oh, like flight or fright. Might be a very adaptive survival behavior. And, and as one looks at these more complex behaviors, why are certain behaviors uh, might be adaptive to survival or not? Well, there are certainly evolutionary biologists who, who look um, look at behavior from an evolutionary point of view. Um, for me, that still doesn't answer the developmental question, and I'm a developmentalist, and that's what, what interests me. Um, so 
if a behaviors, if behaviors have been selected for, they've been selected for, nevertheless, to work <laughs> in a social or environmental context. Um, so we still need to understand dynamic systems in the context of a behavior expression. Uh, the evolution, studying them evolutionarily doesn't displace that need. It's rather a different interest, I think. Right. I mean, like uh, some societies are patriarchal, and they've found that, they've found that, that at least in that context of the environment, that's been very adapted to mm -hmm. On that note, I hope you can all thank me, uh, join me in thanking Anne Foster Sterling for <laughs> 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 <laughs>